Good evening, and welcome to the Christian Truckers Network. This is a ministry that welcomes guest speakers to share their testimonies as well as the Word of God as the Holy Spirit well, I'm leads. glad to uh, be like able to, to introduce our guest speaker for the evening. At- Six four one. I'd like to introduce to you Ashley Smith. Six eight nine. And uh, uh, Ashley's got code. quite a story to share with us. If a lot of you uh, recall the name, again, uh, you'll remember back six four one. In March of 2005, Ashley's life as well as the lives of a whole lot of people did a dramatic change. Um, Praise the Lord. I've uh, heard the change in Ashley's life, and I'm happy to say that it was for the positive, and it's on an uphill, continually growing. So with that, Ashley, the floor is yours, and uh, we're excited to uh, hear what the Lord has laid on your heart to share with us. Well, thank you very much. I'm excited to be with you guys tonight to share a little bit of my story and how God has significantly changed me and brought me from from basically down in the dumps to tell about His glory and how He changed me. So I'll go ahead and start by just telling you all that I, I grew up in what I thought was a, a pretty normal childhood, normal home. Um, my biological father and my mother were married for the first two years of my life, but my biological father was a severe drug addict and alcoholic, and, and so my parents divorced when I was about two years old and um, really didn't have much contact with him for the majority of my life, but the good thing was my, my grandparents um, stepped in and helped my mom, of course, who was then a single mother, raise me, and uh, my grandfather was a uh, retired Marine of 25 years, um, and he was the headmaster of the private Christian school that I went to for quite a while, and he was also a non-denominational preacher. So to say that I had structure in my life would be a complete understatement. I had quite a bit of structure in my life. I often woke up to Reveille, which most of you know is da 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 So that um, was definitely something in my life that I remember. Um, My grandma was this little teeny tiny woman who basically was the glue that held our family together. So my grandparents were definitely um, had a huge impact on my life. I I remember when I was about seven years old and we were um, we were at church and it was revival week at church and although my grandfather wasn't preaching um, I still was in the in the pews listening, and I remember the preacher just talking about hell and and the fire and burning there. And, and as a seven year old, he really scared me to death. And I just remember after that service, going up to my grandpa saying, "Papa, I don't want to burn in that place. I want you to help me invite Jesus into my heart." And so I feel, and I always remember my salvation date as of that when I was seven years old, I asked Jesus into my heart, and and I I believe that I began to to live my life as a Christian, as an adolescent Christian at that point in my life, the best way I knew how to at seven years old, and at seven years old, to me, that looked like saying your Bible verses, you know, doing what you're supposed to, what your parents say, and and leading a a good life, and so um, I was a very good kid for the first half of my life, pretty much. I also was a a very good athlete. Um, My family is a huge sport-loving family. Um, The majority of sports they watch, of course, is football, college football, basketball, baseball, you name it, if it's on the TVs, um, or if if it's playing on TV, then it's coming through to our house. So sports was huge in our li- in my life. Um, my aunt was a college basketball player. She played for Liberty University. And I remember the day my uncle brought her home, I thought she was so beautiful. And, and just uh, I-, I knew I wanted to be just like her because she had it all together. She was beautiful, she was smart, and she was playing basketball in college. So um, at that point in my life, I kind of – asked her and my uncle to teach me the ropes and and teach me how to play basketball because my dream was to grow up and be like her and and play college basketball. And and so I began to do everything I knew how to. I would say that about at age 11, my life consisted of sports, family, and church, and Jesus. And I would 
think that those are pretty good things to have your life surrounded by when you're about 11 years old. Um, but I, um, I began to practice basketball as much as I possibly could. And so, I, uh, as I said earlier, I went to, to private Christian school from the, the time I was born, basically, um, until about the eighth grade. And around eighth grade year, my family began to realize that, hey, you know what? She actually is a really good basketball player, and she might have a chance of getting a scholarship if we put her in the right schools and get her the right exposure. So my family transferred me from the private Christian school that I was raised in to a public school. And to say that culture shock um, set in would, again, be a huge understatement because I I began to to experience things and see things in public school that I had never dreamed of um, or imagined otherwise. Um, I did make the varsity basketball team when I was in the ninth grade, and I played. I was rather good, not to boast on myself, but just to tell you that all that that hard work that I had begun when I was seven years old began to pay off. So I was a good student as well. Again, from the time I was about seven or eight all the way until the time I was about 16, my life pretty much consisted of um, sports, basketball mainly, um, uh, Jesus and church and youth group and my family. That's pretty much where I spent all my time. Now, I would say that when I was about 16 years old, I had everything you could ever imagine materialistically. Um, I had what I thought was the cutest boyfriend, the best car, and I had all of the dreams and aspirations that I had when I was little seemed to be coming true. Now, I'll back up for just a minute and tell you that when I was about 13, 12 or 13 years old, um, my single mom, who had been single, of course, since I was about two years old, um, introduced me to a man, and she told me that they were going to get married and he was going to be my new stepdad. And to be quite honest with you, I didn't, I didn't care too much for him at first. Um, I didn't care for him at all, but that didn't stop my mom from getting married, and they got married, and um, I, up until that point, spent two or three nights a week with my grandparents because my mom um, had business to tend to. She had a, a job in advertising, so she had to entertain people. And and so once my mom got married, um, those nights of spending with my grandparents began to dwindle a little bit because my mom no longer had to work. My stepdad took care of her. And, and I, I, I enjoyed spending time with my grandparents, quite honestly, but I remember my stepfather coming up to me that my mom and stepdad got married in May, and I remember him coming up to me in December of that same year, and he said, listen, I know you don't like me, but if you will give me a chance and start lo- you know, start to like me and show me some love, then I will give you anything you want for Christmas. And of course, my eyes lit up, and I looked at him, I said, you mean you'll give me anything I want for Christmas? And he assured me he'd give me anything. And so I looked them dead in the eyes and I said, all right, I'd like a little baby brother for Christmas. So you can kind of imagine, of course, what my mom and stepfather were looking like and thinking at that point in my, in their life, they were like, wow, we weren't expecting that. But to make a long story short, I got uh, Nike tennis shoes for Christmas that year. But nine months later, my little brother Christian was born. And I remember when he was born, he was the coolest thing in the world. I got to name him after my favorite basketball player, who was Christian Leitner at the time. He was born in 1992, and for those of you listening that know anything about Duke basketball, you'll know that they won the back-to-back championships during that time, and Christian Leitner led um, led them to that. But I just thought my brother was the coolest thing in the world. Nine months and three weeks after my little brother was born, my little sister was born, though, and I didn't ask for her. Now, matter of fact, I wanted to put her back when she came out because she just didn't fit into what I thought um, I wanted my family to be like. But I'm telling you guys that so you'll you'll realize that my life at that point, I was becoming a teenager. I was taken out of private Christian school and put into a, a public school. to where um, I knew nothing um, and and everything was kind of foreign to me. But my life began to change a lot at that point. My mom, who had pretty much shown me all attention, now had two children under the age of two. 
along with the teenager that she had to take care of, and the focus wasn't on me anymore. Um, so lots of things began to change, but I, I held it together for pretty much the most of high school. And as I said before, at 16, I had pretty much anything you could ever imagine you would want. My life was really great. Um, unfortunately, I felt at that point, the, my junior year in high school, I felt like something was missing. Um, and although I had a coolest car, the coolest boyfriend, I had um, college scouts sitting in the stands at my basketball games going to offer me scholarships to come play on their team, and it seemed that all my dreams were coming true. But I still felt like some emptiness was missing inside. and I don't know what it was. Um, I was known at school as an athlete. Now, I didn't hang out with the coolest kids at school at that point in time, but I mean, I was I was known by people. But I remember one of the coolest girls in school came up to me, um, and she she said, "Hey, you know, we're going to be seniors next year, and we're going to have parties, and we're just going to show this school what seniors are like, and we want you to be a part of it." I feel, as I look back on it now, I, I think at that point in my life, I thought, yes, this is what's missing in my life, but being popular. And so I um, accepted her invitation to come and, and go to all these parties that all these kids were participating in. And, and I just remember the first party I went to, uh, all these kids that I looked up to at school, I, I got there and they were all rolling around the ground and tripping over things and some of them were getting injured and they thought it was funny. And I remember looking at them going, what is so funny? Like you're bleeding and you're laughing. And then I began to smell this really funny smell and I began to realize that all these kids were either drunk or high on something. And to be honest with you, everything that I knew up until that point told me to run as far away as I possibly could. And I think Jesus was telling me that I needed to, to flee and get away from that, that situation or those situations. But then uh, Satan came and sat on the other side of my shoulder and said to me, these are the kids you look up to. This is what you wanted. You know, these kids aren't, aren't hurting. They look, they seem to be having fun. Why don't you just participate and have a good time? And I say that with a little bit of sarcasm. It's a good time is because that's the way it was. That's the way it was pic pictured and the way it was portrayed to me was these kids were having a good time. So I didn't participate in any activities um, that first party, but you better believe every party that I went to after that first time, I started to to smoke marijuana and I began to drink and I began to just have what I thought was a good time with these kids. And I started my senior year in high school and I went to – uh, school every day my senior year high on marijuana and my uh, dreams and, and my focus and everything in life began to shift and really to be quite honest all I cared about was hanging out with my friends and having what I thought was a good time all that hard work and dedication that I put into basketball began to fade and although the scouts that were offering me scholarships were still there sitting in the stands going to offer me a scholarship my senior year I didn't really want their scholarships anymore matter of fact about halfway through the season I remember the coaches looking at me and basically kind of shaking their head like I don't know what happened but this girl's changed I began to disrespect my coach in public and I began to blame things on my teammates and they would see me interact with my family after the game and they didn't want me on their team, and quite honestly, I didn't deserve to be on there. Um, but I graduated from high school um, a couple months later by the skin of my teeth, not because of any hard work that I had done, but because of all the hard work my mom had done. She basically got me through my senior year by doing work for me. Um, but I graduated and went and enrolled to a college that I never went to because at that point in my life, all I cared about was having what I thought was a good time and hanging out with my friends. And that looked like partying and doing as many drugs as I could get my hands on. Um, when I was 19 years old, I uh, was at a bar playing pool, and I looked up from the pool table, and I saw what I thought was the most amazingly cute guy I'd ever seen in my life, and I vowed that he would be my husband one day. So he and I began to date, we began to talk, and... Um, that night we began to, to date, and we were pretty much inseparable from the first time we met for three or four years. But I quickly realized that this man that I had met 
was going to solve some problems of mine because I was still 19 and lived at home with my parents or my grandparents, whoever would have me, but I didn't want to follow their rules. But this boy that I met, he had his own house and he owned his own construction company and all he wanted to do was go out and party and go to work and and have a good time and that's what I thought I needed and wanted at that point. So I moved in with him when I was about 19 and a half and we dated for about 10 months. After about 10 months, it came time for him to meet my family and it was Thanksgiving and so he went to Thanksgiving dinner with us and I remember I got really sick the next morning after Thanksgiving, and uh, I called my mom, and I said, Mom, I think there was something wrong with that food because I'm sick, and I've been sick since yesterday, and she said, "Uh, no one else is sick. Uh, Call me back tomorrow if you're still sick. So the next morning, I got sick, and every morning thereafter for the next several days, I got sick, and basically after I called my mom, she said, I'm going to take you to the doctor. So I went to the doctor, and the doctor proceeded to tell me that I was pregnant and I was going to have a baby. And I remember thinking that that was the worst thing that I could that could possibly happen to me in my life at that point. I remember thinking, this is not at all what I envisioned for my life at 19 years old. Here I was, pregnant, not married, um, didn't have a college degree, and my life was pretty much all messed up. Although I felt like God had given me a blessing and I needed to to take care of that. So um, I called my boyfriend and he said, you got two options. You can have an abortion and stay or you can get out of my house and have that baby because I don't want anything to do with it. And I remember thinking to myself, wow, this person that claims he's loved me for the last 10 months of my life doesn't want anything to do with me. He doesn't love me. Here I am pregnant with this child, and he's telling me to get rid of it or to get away from him. And and I felt crushed, but I knew that I had to accept the responsibility that God had given me and that I needed to raise the baby. So I called my parents, and I um, asked them if I could come back home. And my mom, of course, knew the situation, and they welcomed me back into their home. And about two weeks later, I'm I'm pretty sure that my my stepfather called and said whatever he needed to to my boyfriend because my boyfriend's, um, his thoughts and reasoning changed from have an abortion and get out to, I changed my mind, let's just get married. And of course, that's what I wanted in my life at that time. I wanted to have a family. I wanted my child to be raised in an environment to see love and a mommy and a daddy, and, and that was what I wanted. So me and my child's father, we got married. And to tell you a little bit about the relationship, though, other than the fact that all we did up until the time I got pregnant was pretty much party, um, that was pretty much the lifestyle that we led. Now, I I didn't really party or do any drugs that much when I was pregnant with my daughter, but um, when I was about 20 weeks pregnant, I went to the doctor, and the doctor said, you're going to have your baby now, and it's too early for you to have your baby, so we need to do a procedure on you to to make sure she isn't born today. So there was a 50-50 chance that after that procedure was done that my child would no longer be in the womb, Um, but by the grace of God, I woke up after the procedure, and everything was secure, and I held my daughter um, in the womb for about 10 more weeks and she was born at 30 weeks. For those of you listening that know anything about pregnancy, um, a child being born at 30 weeks is, is very crucial and, and very, um, it's a kind of a severe life-threatening situation, actually. So my daughter weighed 2 pounds, 14 and a half inches. She was four, uh, four, 2 pounds, 14 and a half ounces, and she was 14 inches long. She fit in my hand. And I can remember actually looking at my my husband and looking at him saying, you know what, here is this precious little girl that God has given us. And our whole focus up until this point has been about partying and having what we thought was a good time in life. Now here we have somebody that we need to take care of and we need to change. So he and I, we had an agreement that we would stop partying so much and that we would try to be good parents and Um, And that's what we did for the next two and a half years. But there was one exception to that 
to that rule or, or agreement that we had as far as taking care of our daughter. We were going to allow one night of every weekend to ourselves, and we justified it as having a date night. But to be quite honest with you, it was not a date night. What it was was a night for he and I to go out and find all of our friends and find as many drugs as we could and party and have, again, what we thought was a good time at that point in our life. I wish that I had a story to tell you guys that my husband and I, we love Jesus and, and our life was based on God, and but that just wouldn't be the real story. Um, my husband and I went to church maybe three or four times during our marriage, um, and our life really wasn't based on anything except for partying, having a good time, and his business being a successful construction company. Um that went on for about two and a half years um, that we would go out one night of every weekend. We would take our daughter to his mom's house, and she would spend the night with him. And we would go out, and we'd party all night long, and we would pick our daughter up the next day. Well, on August 18th of 2001, we went out like we always did. We met up with some of our friends, and he ran into some old friends of his, and unfortunately, these people didn't care too much for him anymore. Um, to make a very long story short, they got into an argument, kind of got into a, a fight. And that fight led from verbal words to physical um, actions. And he was surrounded by four people. Um, and he was stabbed in the heart about four or five minutes after he was surrounded. Of course, standing in the background watching all of this happen was was just really shocking to me. Um, I remember after he got stabbed, he got up and he t started walking towards me and then he just collapsed. And I didn't know what had happened. I didn't see a knife. They had bats and they had all kinds of other things. Um, but I had no idea that he had been stabbed. So we called the ambulance. And the ambulance came and about 15 minutes after the ambulance came, they looked at me and they said, Miss, Miss Smith, we're sorry, he's gone. And I kind of looked at him and I said, what do you mean he's gone? He's laying right here in front of us. And they said, no, ma'am, he's, he's passed away. And I just remember my heart just sinking, saying, no, this can't be happening. This is my best friend. This is my husband. This is the man that has provided everything for me up until this point. And what hurt the most, I think, was that this was the one person that I knew was going to love my little girl beyond a shadow of a doubt. This was her daddy, and he was her princess. And in the blink of an eye, he was just gone. We had so many hopes and dreams that we were going to build this house and we were going to live this life together and we were going to make these changes and, and in an instant he was gone. Now, I wish I could tell you, again, a different story, but unfortunately the, my story goes uh, in a sense of my family, who is a very God-loving, fearing family, came to me after my, my husband's murder and they said, Ashley, don't you realize that this is God? He's trying to wake you up. He's trying to show you that you've gone off on a bad path and that you, you need to, to make a different turn. And then my family said to me, we knew this was going to happen. And I felt extremely judged and just, I don't know, I, I felt like my family was not having any sympathy or empathy for me as they should at that point in my life. But instead, they were judging me, saying we knew this was going to happen. So unfortunately, I began to build up major walls um, against my family. And my family kept saying, you need to come to church. You need to do this. You need to do that. But then there was my so-called friends that were coming over. and They were saying, here, if you do this, it'll make the pain go away. Here, if you just take this, you won't feel it anymore. And to be quite honest with you, I didn't want to feel any emotion that was going on in my life right now. I was angry at God. I was confused at why he had taken my best friend and my husband and my sole provider and my, my daughter's father away from me. I was sad. I was so many emotions that I just didn't want to feel. And it was so much easier just to numb it. Now, I don't want anyone to, to think that I'm blaming my actions on my friends that were bringing drugs over because that's not at all what I'm doing. I, by choice, took and did whatever they brought over. 
And when they stopped bringing it over, I began to seek it out on my own just to make sure that I didn't feel those emotions that were building up inside of me. But meanwhile, I was um, trying to just live life and continue to be a mom. But if any of you have ever struggled with addiction or drugs or anything like that, you know it's very difficult to do. Um, you you can't really get out from underneath it unless you have the power and the grace of God. And I knew what I was doing was wrong, and, and Satan kept reminding me every day of my life that God did not like what I was doing, that I was too bad, that God didn't love me anymore, that there was nothing I could do to make God love me, that I was just a piece of trash, and I was an awful person, and I might as well just give up. Um, my life, of course, proceeded on the downward spiral that I'm telling you about. Um, in 2003, um, I was introduced to methamphetamines, and up until that point, it was about the only drug that I hadn't done. Um, I had always believed that meth was the one drug that Satan would take your life away from you with, and boy, you better believe that's the truth, because I, again, started doing meth in 2003 and it was it was brought to me um by hey kind of like high school everyone else is doing it it doesn't seem to be hurting anybody as a matter of fact all your girlfriends are skinny and they're getting all their housework done and they've got all this energy so it won't hurt you you can do it too um that of course was the lie that satan told me and i began to do meth and Within about six weeks, I was in such a state of psychosis that I thought terrorists were after me. I began to see things, and I began to hear things. Um, uh, about four months after um, I began using meth, uh, my aunt, who is a very God-loving um, woman, she's a mom of four, she's a doctor's wife, um, just a really great woman, she came to me and she said, Ashley, we see what's going on here, and you, you're you addicted to drugs, and we, we, uh, we want to help you, and you're not taking care of your daughter. My daughter's name is Paige. You're not taking care of Paige the way you should, and we want to help you take care of her and go get help. Well, of course, being strung out on this, I thought my family was just trying to steal my daughter away from me. But after my life-changing experience in 2005, which I'll get to in just a little bit, um, I realized that my aunt basically was really trying to help. You know, she told me uh, that after I declined her help the first time they offered it, she went and she prayed every night for the next week and a half. She prayed Ecclesiastes 2.19, um, it says, Arise, cry out in the night as the watch of the night begin. Pour out your heart like water for the lives of children who faint from hunger at the head of every street. See, I was adamant about my family not taking my daughter away from me. But a week and a half after they approached me the first time, I began to see these strangers come in my house. And although they didn't physically harm my daughter, these people were strung out on this, and, and they were you know, saying hi to her, or they were giving her a hug, or they were just talking to her, and it made me begin to cringe. And I knew that I needed to either change or let her go live somewhere else. And I think beyond a shadow of a doubt, looking back on it, that was probably the saddest day of my entire life, was the day that I gathered all my daughter's things and took her to my aunt's house and let her go, because I began to realize that I didn't love myself. And if I didn't love myself, how could I love this precious little girl who just needed and wanted love? She didn't have a father anymore because he was murdered and taken away from her. All she wanted was the love of her mother, and her mother couldn't give her that because I was so strung out on drugs. Of course, at that point in my life, I did what I knew how to do and what I did best, and that was just cover up the pain and the shame and the sadness and the anger and everything else that was going through my mind with more and more drugs. Um, my daughter went to live with my aunt in February of 2003, and in May of 2003, I was driving my car down the road, and I thought I heard God talking to me again, 
when you're strung out on meth, you begin to hear things and see things that you really think are real. And I thought I heard God say, Ashley, let go and let God. Well, I'm sure I heard God say, Ashley, let go and let God. Unfortunately, at that time, I thought he meant the steering wheel. And so I let go of the steering wheel while I was driving my car going 60 miles an hour down a hill. And I said to God, if it's really you that's talking to me, I'm going to let go of the steering wheel and close my eyes. And when I wake up, if it's really you that was talking to me, then I'll be okay. Nothing will be wrong. Well, only by God's grace did I wake up three days later in intensive care with two broken arms, three broken ribs, and a severed pancreas. I spent 18 days in the hospital trying to recover from that car accident and got out of uh, the hospital claiming that I was going to change and everything was going to be different and um, went back to my same surroundings. I went off to uh, rehab a couple of times after that. Um, The first rehab I went to, I spent two weeks there and um, thought I was healed and better and came home and got high on the way home. The second rehab that I went to, again, it was a 30-day program and spent two weeks there and came home and shortly after that got high again. And it wasn't really until Christmas that same year that I really began to realize that I had a problem and I really needed to change. I remember my family who pretty much up until that point had always accepted anything from me on holidays. My family is huge. We always have a big celebration. And if so-and-so is mad at so-and-so, you just get over it for that day. But this particular year, my family knew that I was still strung out on mess and not doing what I was supposed to. And um, they basically uninvited me to Christmas. And it was there that I said, you know what, I need, I really need to get my life together. There are things that need to change. And that's what I need to do. So I left the surroundings that I um, was in at the time and went away to a recovery center. It was a long-term recovery center. I was supposed to spend three to four months there, um, possibly longer if I needed to. But after about three months, um, the recovery center um, said, you've learned everything that we can teach you. Now you have to go live in the world. Now, while I was at this recovery center, I began to go to church. Um, It wasn't a faith-based recovery program, but it was a place where you could go to church if you wanted to. And I began to go to church, and and I began to have the guts to talk to God. See, up until that point, Satan had told me, you know, you're not good enough. You can't even talk to him. He won't listen. But when I went to rehab, I, I began to talk to God, and I said, God, if you're really there, if, if there really is a chance for me, please just show me the way. And so after, again, after I got out of rehab after about three and a half, four months, um, I moved um, back home. I actually didn't move back home to the place that I lived before because I didn't think it'd be a good um, idea to go back to my same surroundings. So I moved from Augusta, Georgia, where I was originally from, to Atlanta, Georgia. My mom and stepfather had gotten divorced, and my mom had gotten remarried, and she moved to Atlanta. And so I moved to Atlanta there to start a new life in a different surrounding. Um, I did really great for the first three or four months after rehab. I got a job. I got a car. I got an apartment. I spent just about every weekend there was to spend with my little girl. Um, My aunt would either bring her to see me in Atlanta, or I would drive home on the weekends to go see her. And life was really great. Um, And uh, for some reason, I came home to Augusta one day to visit with with my daughter, and I ran into some old friends. And I just wanted to to show them what life would be like if they got off drugs. And um, unfortunately, it didn't go as planned. And instead of helping them get off drugs, they pulled me right back into the same Um, same thing and I relapsed for about seven and a half or eight months and it was honestly the most miserable time of my life because for the six to seven months prior to that counting the 
three or four months of rehab and the three or four, four months out of rehab being clean, I knew what a peaceful life was like. I actually knew what it was like to live on God's terms again. And for some reason, I just threw it all away. Um, I think February 7th of 2005 is a day that I'll remember because I was ending the stint of my meth relapse, and I remember my family called me home, my cousin particularly, and she said, I want you to come home for the weekend. I need to ask you something. And I kind of, you know, smart alecky said, who died? You know, you used to be my best friend, but for good reason, you don't want anything to do with me anymore, and why do you want to talk to me? She said, just come home. So I came home, and she looked me in the eyes, and she said, I'm getting married, and I want you to be in my wedding. And it might seem minimal and minuscule to you guys, but I looked at her, and I began to cry, and I said, why? Why would you want this garbage? Why would you want a, you know, a piece of junk like me in your, in your wedding? And she said, because I love you. And right then and there, for the first time in a long time, I felt loved by my family. And my aunt looked at me because she was sitting next to my cousin, and she said, Ashley, if you will just turn your life back over to God, then maybe one day you'll be getting married too, and we'll be planning a wedding for you. And for some reason, I believed her. She looked at me right then and there, and she said, Honey, we're going to be at church tomorrow, of course. Um, We'd like for you to come. I looked at her and I said, hey, Kim, I can't go to church. If I go to church, all the walls will cave in on everybody there, and I'll be responsible for all the people's death. You know, all the people there will die. And she looked me dead in the eyes, and she said, you are not that important that God would take other people's lives just because you stepped foot in church. And I kind of looked at her and said, okay, touche. <laughs> you got a point there, hon. Um, so I showed up at church the next day, and When I walked into that church, I just remember feeling God's arms wrap around me and say, I love you. There is absolutely nothing you could do to make me not love you. I want you to quit believing these lies that Satan's telling you that you're not important and you're not good enough because you don't have to be important and you don't have to be good enough. I died for you the way you are, and I love you the way you are. As I sat there in the back of that church, I just began to cry, and I began to talk to God, and quite honestly, my my prayers were were very adolescent and childish, and I I just said, God, you know, I'm, I'm sick and tired of living this life, but I don't know how to change. I don't want to lie to you and tell you that I'm done doing drugs, because my self-control is so gone that I just do things without thinking, but I can tell you that my heart is tired and I don't want to do this anymore so please help me I I felt like I had absolutely no purpose in that life in in my life anymore and anything that I had ever identified myself as example a mother a wife a positive member of society a Christian anything that I had ever identified myself as I wasn't anymore, or I wasn't acting like anymore. And so as I sat there in the pews, I said to God, please just show me show me that you're here and show me that, that you will help me. And right about that time, the pastor held up a copy of The Purpose Driven Life, and on the front of it it says, what on earth are we here for? And I kind of looked up at God, and I said, I guess this is your answer. This is your way of showing me that you're here. So I picked up a copy of that Purpose Driven Life book, and And I signed the inside of it as a contract that says you will read one chapter every day for the next 40 days. And and that's what I began to do. I drove back home to Atlanta and I said, all right, God. I'm going to I'm going to give these next 40 days to you. I turned my radio station from um from all the mainstream stuff to only Christian music and I began to read my Bible and I began to pray and I began to just ask God to show up every day in my life. Um for the next next 33 days that did happen. God began to show up in my life and and my life began to change. I wish I could tell you that there were no days that I didn't relapse and um, and go back to that life, but there were two days that I did during that time. And instead of instead of feeling judged and belittled at that point in my life, I felt God say, "It's okay. Just do something different the next time." And so 
Um, March 11th, 2005 is really the day that my life changed for the better. Um, I remember waking up um, about about 2, 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and I got a call from uh, my stepfather saying that there's a man that's escaped from the courthouse. He's killed four people, and he's on the loose. And I thought about it for a second, and I thought, okay, well, you know, the courthouse is 30 miles away. Um, surely the police will catch this guy by then. I'm not really that worried about it. You know, to be quite honest, I was basically selfish. And as I look back on it now, I'm pretty sure God was protecting me from too much detail. Um, after I hung up the phone with my stepfather, um, I turned on the TV, of course, and looked at the news a little bit. And I saw this man that um, had escaped from the courthouse. I saw his picture and, and um, you know, just took a mental note of, of what he looked like um, on the news. And then I went to work. I had to work the night shift um, at a local sports bar there. So I went in to work my night shift, and um, I got off about 9.30 or 10 o'clock. When I got off, I noticed two police officers um, in, in the restaurant. So I walked over to them, and I said, hey, um, have you guys caught that man yet? Um, and they said, no, don't worry about him. He's probably in Alabama by now. So I thought, okay, well, the cops think he's in Alabama by now. I'm fine. Well, I got off work and uh, went home. I had moved into a new apartment. And my aunt was bringing my daughter to visit the next day. So um, I uh, went home and was unpacking and trying to prepare for my little girl to visit. And about, I don't know, about one thirty, two o'clock in the morning, I was done. And it was time for me to go to bed. And I wanted to smoke a cigarette. And I didn't have any cigarettes, so I decided I'd drive to the store. And so I left my um, I left my apartment, and when I was leaving my apartment, I noticed a truck pulling up. And I didn't pay any attention to it. I thought it was just a neighbor, um, although it was almost 2 o'clock in the morning on a weekend night. I didn't think twice about it because uh, I thought people go out all the time in Atlanta at that, at that time. So uh, I went to the store, I was gone about five minutes, and then when I came back, I noticed that the truck had moved, and it was closer to my apartment. Um, I also noticed that the man was still sitting in the truck, and I thought, mm, that's kind of weird. Um, and then I thought to myself, Ashley, you are permanently paranoid from all the drugs you've done in your life. That man wants nothing to do with you. Just get out of the car and go inside. So I did that. I got out of my car, and I began to walk to my front door. And as I began to walk to my front door, I heard the man get out of the truck. And I began to get very scared because I heard someone walking up behind me. So I ran to my front door, and I unlocked the door. And when I turned around, he was standing right behind me with a gun pointed right at my face. And I began to scream, of course. And um, he said, shut up. If you shut up, I won't hurt you. Now, I did not know who he was at first. Um, to be quite honest with you, my aunt and I had had a conversation about a week and a half before this. And she had said something very bold to me. She said, honey, I want you to know something. Uh, me and the girls at Bible study, we've been praying for you. And uh, we've been praying that God either change you or he'd take you home. And I remember being very shocked that my aunt would pray that, that God would either change my life or take me home. Um, and so as I stood there looking at this man holding the gun pointed at my head, the thought crossed through my mind, you're never going to change. This is what your aunt prayed for. You're going to die tonight, and you're never going to get to be the mom that you wanted to be and the mom that you promised your little girl that you'd be. You're never going to get to be the Christian that you kept saying, God, kept saying to God, not now, come back later. My life isn't good enough for you right now, God. I just have to get my life good enough for you. It's never going to get to that point because I'm going to die. I'm never going to get to be a wife again. I'm never going to get to, to be a positive member of society or a positive impact on anyone because my life is going to be over. Now, this man, of course, looked at me and, and he said, um, if you shut up, I won't hurt you. Well, I don't know about you, but if a gun is pointed at your face by somebody and they tell you to do something and they won't hurt you, you do it. So I, at that point in time, I had my mind made up that whatever this man asked me to do, I would do. 
Um, so he told me to shut up, so I was quiet. I walked in the house, and he closed and locked the door behind me. And he looked at me, he said, is there anybody else here? And I said, no. He looked at the pictures on my wall. He said, what about that little girl? I said, she doesn't live here. She lives with my aunt right now. And he said, all right, I want you to walk to the bathroom. So I walked to the bathroom, and it was there that he um, asked me if I knew who he was. And I didn't know who he was at first. I thought he was the man that my aunt prayed for. And he said, have you been watching the news today? You know, the whole escape thing with Brian Nichols. And I was like, where have I heard that name from? And then he took off the hat that he was wearing on his head. And he, I recognized his face from the mugshot I had seen on TV. And I began to put two and two together and realized that he was the man that had escaped from the courthouse. Of course, my heart sank because I knew he had, at that time, I knew he had killed three people and I was scared. He had a gun pointed at me and another one in his waistband. And he said, listen, I don't want to hurt anybody else. I just want to relax. If you do everything I say, I won't hurt you. And for some reason, I believed him. Although I was very scared, I began to just pray, God, please take care of me. Now, I could stay on the phone with you guys probably another 24 hours and tell you guys the whole story about what happened that night, but I'm just going to give you some some details um, about that night, some important things. But, you know, over the next seven hours that I was held hostage by Brian Nichols, after about an hour and a half of being held hostage, he, uh, he looked at me and he said, um, do you have any weed? I don't know. I guess I just look like your typical party girl or something that he felt like he could ask me that. But I didn't have any weed, uh, but I had some meth in my house. I know you guys are all going, wait a minute, I'm confused here. Now, she told us that she was reading The Purpose Driven Life and her life was changing. And, but I also told you that there was a couple days during those 40 days that I was reading The Purpose Driven Life that I relapsed. And one of those times happened to be the day before Brian Nichols came in my life. I had relapsed on this, and for some reason I had saved it, but what I'd left over from the night before. And so when he said, do you have any weed? I said, no, I don't have any weed, but I've got some mess. And he said, good, I've heard all about that. That's That's just what I need. I need to stay awake. And so he asked me to set it up for him, and I did. And, and then three different times he asked me, he said, do you want to do this with me? How about you do this with me? Come on, do this with me. And there is nobody that can tell me anything different. I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jesus Christ took the body of Brian Nichols at that moment. And Brian Nichols wasn't asking me if I wanted to do best with him, but Jesus was asking me if I wanted my life to change or if I wanted to go home. And I looked at Brian Nichols after he asked me that third time, and I said, you know what, I don't care if I've got five minutes to live or if I've got 50 years to live. I never want to touch that stuff again. That stuff has ruined my life, and I don't ever want to touch it again. And by the grace of God, I've not touched any illegal drugs or anything since the day before Brian Nichols came into my life. You know, for years and years and years, I struggled so much with being free and getting rid of getting free from that and in a blink of an eye when I was really ready to turn everything over to God he immediately took it from me I, I look back on things now and I say for years and years and years I noted on or I spoke on this a few minutes earlier um, for years and years I kept trying to get my life right before God would accept me or before I could go back to God. But at that moment, I began to realize that God wanted me just the way I was. There wasn't anything I had to get right because I couldn't ever get right enough for him without him. Well, again, for the next seven hours, many conversations um, were had between Brian Nichols and myself. I began to tell him about my family, and I, I shared many of the things that I've shared with you guys tonight. Um, but after choosing not to do the drugs, he, he looked at me, and and uh, um, I looked at him. I said, do you mind if I read? Um, and I had remembered that I hadn't read my day of the purpose-driven life, and he said, sure, you can read as long as you read it out loud to me. 
So I went and I got my Purpose Driven Life book and I read the chapter the day that it was, chapter 33. It's using what God gave you. It talks about living your life on God's terms and living it in the shape that God has for you, not the shape that you think you you ought to live. But Brian Nichols and I had a couple conversations and and um, he said, what do you think I should do? I said, well, you know, you have to turn yourself in. Everyone makes mistakes. We have to pay the prices for that. And he said, but they're going to kill me for what I did. I said, well, you have no idea what God's plan is for you. You don't know if they're going to kill you. Um, and I said, he said, well, you know what I think you should do with your life. I think that you should tell people about your life. And I said, duly noted, okay. Um, and about 6 o'clock in the morning, um, he had... I found out that he had killed a fourth person and he had stolen their truck and that's whose truck was parked outside my house. And he knew it was going to be getting light outside and that people would be looking for him and looking for the truck once they found um, the body of David Wilhelm. And so he um, he said, I have to get rid of this truck. I need you to, to follow me and, and do that. And I was honestly praying to God, saying, God, please direct me and help me make the right decisions. And I, after I chose not to do the drugs, I felt like I wasn't in control of my life anymore, but that God was in the driver's seat, that he was going to do everything I needed for him to do. Um, and so I um, followed Ryan Nichols um, in my car to um, – put the truck in a different place and he of course had guns pointed at me during that time it wasn't like a choice thing that I did I was basically forced to do it I got in my car and knowing that if I didn't follow him that he would come back to my apartment and if he got away then was missing for a day or two that he could come back to where I was and um, do anything that he wanted um so I followed him and um, got rid of the truck at about 8 o'clock in the morning after we were back at my apartment. He, um, he looked at me and he said, what time do you need to leave to visit your daughter? Um, as I told you guys earlier, my aunt was bringing my daughter to visit that weekend and I was supposed to meet her at a specific place and I had told him that I was supposed to meet her and if I didn't show up that my family would worry because despite the fact that I was a, a drug addict and wasn't um, very good in decision making I would never miss a day with my daughter and so about eight o'clock that morning he said what time do you need to leave to visit your daughter and I kind of looked at my watch and I said, now looks like a really good time for me to get out of here. And this man who brutally murdered four people looked at me and said, um, I wish I would have met you under different circumstances because I, I think we could have been friends. He said, will you please tell your daughter Paige hello for me? And he reached in his pocket and he grabbed my cell phone battery and he grabbed some money and he said, you might need this. And I grabbed my keys and I began to walk towards the door not knowing if he was going to shoot me or actually let me walk out the door and he let me walk out of the door and I began to walk towards my car and again not knowing whether or not he was going to to shoot me or not I got in the car and I drove off and and felt relief and I immediately felt the presence of God and I knew that he was going to take care of me. And so I called 911. And as I called 911, um, they answered that it was busy the first two times. And the third time they answered. And no one believed me at first. And I told them that this man that they were looking for had been in my apartment all night. And finally, after I had told them a, a couple of key things, they knew I was telling the truth. And so they came to the apartment and they surrounded it. And, of course, I was in the back of a police car watching all of this happen by this point. But um, but uh, about, I don't know, 30, 45 minutes after they had surrounded the apartment, my front door opened and Brian Nichols came out waving a white flag or a white T-shirt in surrender. 
And I just felt a sense of peace and a sense of presence of, you know what, no one else got hurt after this situation. I felt God really give me a new clean slate and said, you want a new life? I just gave you a new life. Now do with it what you want, but bring me glory. Of course, uh, Brian Nichols surrendered, and the next day on the front page of the Atlanta Journal-Constitution was a two-page picture of me, and it said, an angel sent from God, and I really just wanted to go hide under a rock because the story that I just told you guys was not that of an angel. It was more that of someone who was broken and beaten down, but that God, that reached out to God, and God said, you want me to send you into the world to give me glory, I'll send you. Um, and I just, my life really began to change after that. I began, I moved away from Atlanta and moved back to Augusta, uh, where my daughter lived. I moved into the house with my aunt and uncle, and I stayed there for a year so I could put my life back together and make sure that I was going to stay clean and make sure I was well enough and right enough to um, to be the mother that my daughter deserved. But I knew that my life had changed, and I began to go to Bible study all the time, and I began to pray that God send me new friends. And every news station and magazine and book people were calling and saying, we want you to write this book and do this movie and all this. And, and I took a step back, and I said, you know what? All that's really flattering. But I need some time to think for a little bit. I need to I need to understand why God chose me, why God reached down into the pits of hell that my life had become, and he pulled out the lonely, widowed, drug addict mom that actually, of all the people in Atlanta, would have deserved death. He could have chosen anybody else to be some hero as they were deeming me at that point in my life, but instead he chose me, and I have to figure out why he chose me before I do any book or movie or magazine or whatever you guys want me to do. And so my family and the Bible study girls and the preacher and lots of close family and friends um, gathered around me over the next six weeks, and they just began to pray, God, what is it that you want her to do with this? And long story short, every time we prayed, it was always the same answer. I just want you to go to the world and I want you to tell them the truth. I want you to tell them what I saved you from. He didn't just save me from, from a, a bad life. He changed my life radically. He took the sadness and he took the shame and he took the pain and he took the anger. And when I gave it to him, when I actually allowed him to take those things away from me, not only did he take them away from me, but he allowed me to use them in a good way to help change my life and hopefully change the lives of others. That's the only reason that I ever share my testimony is in the hopes that it will help someone realize that if God reached down into the pits of hell and changed my life, that he would definitely change theirs as well. Now, that happened to me. The Brian Nichols incident happened to me over 12 years ago. It would actually be 13 years in March of, of this year. A lot has changed in my life since then, of course. Um, after about a year and a half after it happened to me, um, I got custody back of my daughter. Uh, I have been through many trials and tribulations over, over the last 13 years, and I wish I could say that my life was perfect and, and I'm just living happily ever after, but every day is a struggle for me. I, I've had good days and I've had bad days. I've I walked through the the very painful um moment in my life where I lost my mother to cancer. She was my best friend, and about two months after um, I was set free from Brian Nichols, uh, my mom told me she had cancer and she had two or three years to live, and those were some really difficult times because I felt like I was supposed to have a good life. Nothing bad was supposed to happen anymore, but what I began to realize was that it wasn't right, or it wasn't, it wasn't 
for me to not have bad things to happen. It was for me to realize that God was going to walk through those hard times with me and get me through them with him. You know, he, he laid on the cross and died for us all. He died for all of those sins. And he died to carry the weight of the burdens that I was trying to carry by myself. Since since uh, March of 2005, I have um, gone back to school and got a degree in, in radiology. I, I'm currently an x-ray tech and CT tech. I work at a couple of different places in my hometown. Um, I've gotten married to... Um, to a, a good man, I have a, a stepdaughter, and I also have a, a new son. Not, he's not new. He's six years old, but my life has just dramatically changed. Um, instead of being um, addicted to, to drugs, I, I choose to be addicted to Jesus. So um, if there's anybody out there listening that really honestly think that, that God um, he he's not for you, or he doesn't care about you, or that you're not good enough for him. I want you to know that you you are you are the reason that he gave his life. You are the reason that that he died on that cross, and you're the reason that he rose again. Because one day he's going to come back for us and take us home to live with him forever in heaven. Uh, thank you all for listening. If you have any questions, I think we'll be taking questions in just a little bit. Amen, amen. Well, Ashley, I know you've been asked every question that is known to man. I'm quite sure I've uh, watched a lot of your uh, videos on the Internet, and, uh, you know, looked at your book and all the TV shows that people have uh, had you, you know, on and uh, having you relive all this. Uh, we definitely appreciate that. And uh, we could take just a, a short break, and then when we come back, open up the lines for any questions that they might have. We'd greatly appreciate that. Sure. We would like to invite you to tune in to Smokehouse Studios Front Porch Show. We're live Saturday evenings at 6 p.m. Central Time. We discuss current events and Bible prophecy and how it all relates into the days that we find ourselves in today. You can find Smokehouse Studios Front Port Show by searching for it on iHeartRadio, TuneIn Radio, and Spreaker Radio. We also invite you to tune into our website at smokehousestudios.net. There you can click the radio show link, and on the radio show page there is a player there to hear our shows as well. They do podcasts, so you can go back into the archives and listen to our past shows. Tune in Saturday evenings at 6 p.m. Central Time. Well, we thank you. And uh, uh, the floor is open. Uh, if anybody has any questions or any comments, uh, those who are listening by radio, uh, if you have any questions, comments, you're welcome to call in as well. As in the beginning of the show, the number that was listed, I'll repeat again, it's 641-715-0689. Then they'll ask for an access code. That's 863-397. And then the pound sign. Uh, if anybody has any questions, the floor is open. And uh, away we go. I got, I got a couple, if you uh, don't mind. Sure. During the during the trial process, was was there was he ever um, angry at you for reporting him to the police or anything like that? Well, you know, uh, that was one of the things that I prayed for before I went to court was that I'd be protected because I was kind of given a heads up that he was trying to give people eyes and kind of intimidate them. So to be honest with you, I did not have any eye contact or any contact with him whatsoever. I was on the stand for, I don't know, four, four or five hours. Um, and, and thankfully, I just kept my head focused on my family and, and my head focused on the questions that were being asked to me so that I could answer them as honest as I possibly could. 
Yep, and I know you didn't witness the murders or nothing, but yep. Uh, and then uh, the other question is, is uh, what kind of car? What kind of car did I have, dude? Yeah. No, no, what kind of car did you have? You said you had the best of everything when you were young. Uh, what kind oh, of your best oh, car, best young. everything? When I was young, I had a I had a lifted up Jeep Wrangler. It was white. It had chrome all over it. <laughs> it was awesome. <laughs> all right, I just I just had to find out what kind of car it was. Uh, awesome Thank story, you. young lady. <laughs> Thank you. You know, as I as I had listened to all the interviews and uh, you know all the talk shows that you were on and. You know, I know uh, there was uh, a few of them there that were uh, Christian-based, and, and you know, and I know there were some that were, you know, secular as well. And and when I sat and I listened to it all, you know, it it, it there was just, in my mind there was two things that was going on. The one was the whole thing with Brian, and you know, all it was like all that was set aside. But with you, it was a spiritual war that was going on. You know, and that and the whole situation with Brian just had to be something that that came into that spiritual warfare that you were involved in. Yeah, I think we both realized during that night, um, and we kind of talked on it that that there was a spiritual warfare going on between myself and him, and and I think that's one of the reasons during the night I began to realize, you know what, this this isn't just by chance that this happened, God. God has got something going. He has put two of his people here that he has died for. Because despite the fact that Brian Nichols murdered four people, when we get to heaven, his sin of murdering four people is going to be no different than my sin of choosing drugs over my daughter at one point in my life. And I just began to realize that it was a spiritual warfare battle that both of us were were, were fighting at that point in our lives. And God put us together maybe for that reason. And one of the things that I didn't say was, you know, when he did go to trial and, and he claimed, remember, he said to me, they're going to kill me for what I did. He didn't get the death penalty. You know, he got the rest of his life in prison where he has the opportunity, if he wants to, to minister to people in prison. And I know all too well that people in prison need Jesus, too. So he has the opportunity Amen. to further the kingdom of God with his life right now. And until the day he dies... The same way I'm doing. Ever any contact with him? I have not had any contact with him, no. Um, I've had some contact with his family when the movie came out uh, in 2015. Um, yeah, um, when it came out about two years ago, I interacted with his mom, his brother, and his father. And his mom just thanked me for cooking him pancakes, which I did. And there's just a lot of a lot of things about the story that I, I couldn't touch on tonight, but you guys can read it in my book. Um, sometimes I've often thought about, you know, is, God, do you want me to write a letter and reach out to him? And I just, every time I think about it, I just pray, God, if that's what you want, I need you to, to send me a, a, a very heavy sign that it's you and it's not anything else trying to lead me down that direction. So up until this point, no contact yet. Okay, amen, yep. Yeah. You know, I know everybody's got a point that breaks them. And with the different uh, things that I was listening to and, and with your book, you know, I don't know, you know, the, I don't know exactly where it was that, you know, which interview or whatever that I heard it. But I heard that, you know, even at one point when he was uh, securing you with uh, the tape and that, uh, he was concerned that he wasn't hurting you. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, um, and, you know, and he took a shower in my house, and he placed a tower o over my face, and he said, "You don't, you don't want to watch a black man take a shower." And I thought, "Wow, that's kind of strange that you even care." Um, yeah, and then he he tied me up and wanted to make sure what hurt me, and it was just a, a a lot of things about it that I I began to realize again that this wasn't just by chance. This was all a a, a situation that God had basically put my life in for me to either change or come home right right and you know there had to, there had to be some peace. well we know for a fact you know god gives you that peace that surpasses all understanding and once you had come to that conclusion that god was in control and that whatever was going to happen you know it, it was in god's control and 
And, you know, and then when I heard how, you know, and like you just mentioned, how you made them pancakes the next morning, you know, they, at that point, was the fear of dying, was the fear of what the possible negative outcome could be, was that all kind of gone away because well, of the I of knew, I knew that when I chose not to do the drugs, I thought to myself, before I chose not to do them, I said, do I want to die tonight knowing that I had just done drugs and gone to heaven? Or would I like to stand in front of God and say, for once in my life, God, I finally said no. So whether I die tonight or not, I want to know that I said no, um, it, and it did bring me peace of knowing that God's in control. I really honestly felt God take control of my life when I said, no, I don't want to do this anymore. I felt God take control and say, all right, you're giving me control of the good, the bad, and the ugly of your life, and I'm taking it. Amen. So that was the, would you say that at that point, that was the true breaking point for you, even though you were uh, going to church, we're involved in reading, and, uh, you know, you did have a couple of relapses, and, you know, we all know yes. what that's about. But yes, I definitely that think that, that that was a true turning point of my life, for sure. Okay, okay. Because I, I just surrendered everything to God. I, you know, up until that point, I, again, was still fighting that you're not good enough. I think I was, tr by reading The Purpose Driven Life, I was trying to get my life back to a place that I thought would be good enough to place before God. And in that moment, I realized I don't have to do that. God won't. He, he died for my sin, and I just need to give him my sin right when I'm in the middle of it. Here is my sin. Take it from me. Amen. Amen. Out of curiosity, did, did uh, Rick Warren ever reach out to you? He did, actually, yes. Uh, the <laughs> first interview I did, I was on the Oprah show, and then she surprised me with uh, with meeting him. And then I've been to Saddleback a couple times and got to interact and, and have um, conversations and, and get-togethers with him. And he, he really is a really is a great God-fearing man. Appreciate amen, all of amen. I just appreciate who he is and what he represents. Yeah, I've read that book as well, and it's, it's it's good. It's good. I know another gentleman that's on the line. Uh, he's read it and uh, used and read another one of his books uh, that he has out. But uh, if anybody else has any other questions, I'll be quiet. Well, I guess with that being said. Uh, I do appreciate the time that you have spent with us, Ashley. Yeah, I thank can only you for imagine, having me. You know, I think about when, uh, you know, when this first happened. How long of a, I do have a question, how long of a uh, time span was it from the time that this happened until you came out publicly and started talking to people? Um, I actually did my very first interview. I did my first interview two days or the day after, and then after that, as I said, we took a we took a break, um, and after about six weeks, I decided that I would write my book, Unlikely Angel, and that whole process took about three and a half months. My, my book was released in September, so from March to September, I didn't have a whole lot of um, news outings or anything like that, but when the book came out, of course, I did every show there basically is to do, uh, promote the book, and and answering everybody's questions, so it was it was quite a few months in between. But it gave me time to, to realize what it was God wanted me to do. Also, right, right. I got I got one more question. Then, oh, sorry, Steve, go ahead. No, 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 no. Go on, go on. Um, kind of looking for a little praise report. Have you become that mother that God that you've asked God uh, for you to be? <laughs> Definitely have been become that. Although I do still struggle. I have two teenage girls that are eighteen and sixteen, so you can only imagine what that brings at times. Uh, <laughs> yes, ma'am. Yep. Uh, I got a seventeen year old daughter and uh twenty two year old twin boys, so yeah, oh, I know wow. what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah, well I <laughs> and I'll pay do my best, but she she's great. She she's eighteen, she's a senior in high school and she, she's doing well, trying to trying to find her way. Also, yep. I, I got I just got a text message from my daughter tonight that she sent me a thing and wanted to know if I'd help her do it. She wants to go to CNA, become a CNA schooling, and oh yeah, and, great. Uh, 
I'm like, oh my gosh, yeah. <laughs> that was last last week we were talking. I'm like, you got anything figured out or any plans? And she's like, no, not really. And you know, I mean, she, like I said, she's 17 and still having fun. And and uh, um, and then when she sent me this text, I'm like, oh my gosh, now what? You know, like, so. <laughs> yeah. That's her but, happy uh, I, I thought after. that was pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you well, again, again for having Ashley. me. Yeah. Yes, and I'd, I'd like to uh, have a word of prayer with you before you leave. Sure, would love that. Thank you. Oh, hallelujah. Father God, we just thank you for this evening, Lord, and we thank you for the the courage and the struggle that it must have been, Lord, as uh, Ashley came out of this situation and to share her story and share her testimony. Father God, we praise you, Lord, and, and Father God, that her testimony was to glorify you, to show in how you move. And Lord, for these that will be listening to this and listening to the recordings of it, that they see that there is there is there is nobody that you don't love. There is nobody that can get to a point where you turn their back on them. You're always there waiting for them to turn around. But, Father God, you never leave them or forsake them. And I praise you for that, Lord. Father, I pray that you would continue to bless Ashley and her family. I pray your hedge of protection around them, Lord. I pray your blessings upon them, Father God. Lord, I pray that you continue to open doors up unto Ashley, that she can share her testimony and to give you glory. So, Father God, as we go, uh, Lord, I again, I just want to praise you for that. And I and I pray for all those that are listening, Lord God, that it has uh, touched their hearts, touched their lives. And, Father God, open their eyes. And if there are any that are struggling with these addictions, know that God is there for you. And it's not the end of your life. It's not the end of the world. It's it could be the turning point like Ashley's seen, and it could be the beginning of your life. So, Father God, we just thank you for this evening. We thank you for this time. And, again, I, I pray your blessings upon Ashley and her family, and we give all the glory and all the honor to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. You Amen. Have a good evening, thank you again. Ashley. Thank you again. And, uh, you guys take care. You as well. God bless, young lady. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.